this episode is titled Syncretism. Now, recent episodes have chronicled the growing rift between the Eastern Church centered at Constantinople and the Western based in Rome. At the Council of Chalcedon in 451, Eastern bishops elevated the Bishop of Constantinople to near equal status and authority with the Bishop of Rome, effectively giving the church two heads. It was increasingly obvious that politics was playing a greater role in church affairs than the quest for doctrinal purity and faithfulness to the gospel mandate. East and West were moving in opposite directions. Since the new Rome of Constantinople was the political center of the empire, the Eastern Church grew increasingly linked to imperial power. In the year 380, on the 27th of February, in his Edict of Thessalonica, the Emperor Theodosius declared Christianity the official state religion of the empire and banned paganism. Since the church had no authority or power to enforce compliance to the faith or to punish unconverted pagans, imperial power was lent to enforce the emperor's will. This forced conversion of vast multitudes of pagans saw an influx of new church members whose commitment to the gospel was doubtful. Priests were now in the uncomfortable position of having to lead people that they knew were at best only nominally committed. Since the Christianity of the 4th century had moved away from its roots in Judaism with its knee-jerk hostility to idolatry, a growing number of priests, who themselves been idol-worshipping pagans before conversion, thought that it might facilitate the assimilation of these new converts to the faith if concessions were made to the old forms. Why not take age-old traditions and direct them to new ends? So the veneration of angels, saints, relics, pictures, and statues was an attempt to bring ex-pagans into a more familiar form of worship and accommodate their religious sensitivities. Of this process, the historian Philip Schaff writes this, quote, The Christianizing of the state amounted in great measure to a paganizing and secularizing of the church. The world overcame the church as much as the church overcame the world, and the temporal gain of Christianity was in many respects canceled by its spiritual loss. The mass of the Roman Empire was baptized only with water, not with the spirit and the fire of the gospel, and it smuggled heathen manners and practices into the sanctuary under a new name." Unquote. Now, it's a risky venture attributing motive to those who are removed from us by such a long distance of time, but I suspect for many church leaders, the assimilation of pagan forms into the liturgy of the church was seen as a necessary concession to the large numbers of pagans now required to convert. The hope was that these new nominal church members learned the gospel, the truth would then set them free from their superstitions, and the church could return to a pure and orthodox liturgy. No doubt the reasoning went something like, God had become man to reach sinful men, why could not the church become, to use the Apostle Paul's words, all things to all people in order to win the more? The problem is, if that was the rationalization for adopting pagan forms of worship, <laughs> it didn't work. The church didn't temporarily materialize its liturgy to accommodate nominal members. It institutionalized those pagan forms, making them into new traditions, some of which continue to this day. Another unfortunate development during this time was the distance that developed between the clergy and the laity. For the first three centuries, lead pastors and bishops, as they were called at that time, were honored as God-ordained leaders by their congregations, but they weren't regarded as special. The elevation of bishops and priests into a special class developed rather slowly during the 4th and 5th centuries, so that by the dawn of the 6th, they were regarded as unique, part of a distinct category. The reason for this elevation differed in the East and West. In the East, church and state were joined in a religio-political union. Because of the close affinity between priest and politician, clergy adopted the lavish trappings of Eastern officials. Constantine, you may remember from our previous episode, had begun this trend when he moved his capital to Constantinople. He adorned himself as a traditional opulent Eastern monarch rather than one of the more austere Western emperors. 
For the first two centuries, Western clergy wore clothing similar to their congregations. But as the monastic movement began providing more priests for the church, it was the monks' habit, that is their dress, that became prominent. This continued for some time among the priesthood, but as the political structure of the Western Empire fell apart and church leaders were increasingly looked to to provide civil governance, some bishops adopted garments that marked them as civil rulers, then favoring their robes with religious symbols. But the message was clear. Church and state had merged in the office of bishop. Then, at general councils, when Western bishops observed the sumptuous regalia of their Eastern peers, they aspired to wear similarly elegant gear, and they began to don the Eastern fashions. All of this only served to further distance the clergy from the laity. Another carryover from paganism was the observance of special days. Constantine set Sunday as the official day of Christian worship. In the mid-4th century, Christmas became a regular practice, taking over the pagan December festival of Saturnalia. Epiphany celebrated either in the West the visit of the Magi, or in the East Jesus' baptism. The annual commemoration of notable martyrs became what are known as the Saints' Days. More rituals were added to the church calendar. The only two sacraments that we find in the New Testament call Christians to the practice of baptism and communion. But by the end of the 6th century, five more were added. The development of the doctrine of original sin encouraged the practice of infant baptism. The emergence of communion as the centerpiece of worship saw a deepening of its meaning from a commemoration of Jesus' death to a reenactment of it, one that was so special it became a means of imbuing special grace on those who partook of it. The Church Father Cyprian taught that a priest acted in Christ's place at communion and that he offered a true and full sacrifice to God. Pope Gregory I emphasized this sacrificial nature of communion. By the dawn of the 7th century, sacerdotalism was well on its way. Now, sacerdotalism is the belief that grace is literally and actually bestowed on worshipers through the mediating influence of an ordained priest officiating the sacraments. So think of it this way. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. The official position of the church was that by the faith of the officiating priest working in harmony with the worshiper, the sacraments were vehicles by which grace was bestowed and salvation renewed. Spiritual vitamins to keep one healthy. All of this led to a further separation of clergy and laity. And later, it became the means by which church leaders could manipulate civil officials. You see, when the clergy have the power to bestow grace through the sacraments, they can threaten a ruler to comply or risk the torment of hell. The veneration of saints grew out of a long tradition that held the martyrs in the highest regard. It's not difficult to see how those who died during the persecution were esteemed as heroes and examples that all could and should aspire to. The anniversary of their martyrdom was made a day of commemoration, eventually morphing into saints' days. Since pagans were in the habit of lauding their heroes by marking them with special celebrations, attributing them with special powers, the saints' days were substitutes for these celebrations, and the saints were accorded special access to God. What had been prayers by Christians at the tombs of martyrs for the peaceful repose of the martyr's soul turned into prayers to the saints for their intercession with God and requests of the saints to assist them in their special area of expertise. So, going on a journey? Well, ask St. Christopher for, for protection. Starting a new business venture? Ask St. Bartholomew for prosperity. On and on it went. The veneration of saints was endorsed by the Second Council of Nicaea in the 8th century. Churches and chapels were built over saints' graves and became destinations for pilgrims. Festivals associated with their death were placed on the calendar, and legends of miracles associated with them developed rapidly. Traffic and relics, including parts of a saint's body, things like teeth or hair and bones, became so great a problem, an imperial order stopped it in 381. These relics became the focal point of many of the cathedrals that were built across Europe, 
and ultimately the goal of the millions of pilgrimages that people embarked on during the Middle Ages. Now think of a cathedral as merely a large ornate box that held some saint's shin bone. You get the idea. The use of images and pictures in worship expanded rapidly as increasing numbers of pagans came into the church. Images gave substance to the invisible reality of deity for these superstitious worshipers. Pictures also had a decorative function in beautifying churches. The Church Fathers tried to make a distinction between reverence for images and worship, but it's doubtful that this distinction prevented peasants from conflating an image with the thing that it was meant to represent. Government aid after Constantine led to extensive church building. These imperial churches followed the basilica architecture the Romans had developed for their public buildings. Constantine's mother, Helena, visited Israel in her later years and was thought to have discerned both by the Spirit's leading and local reports the location of several biblical events, leading, of course, to the construction of churches right over where those events were supposed to have occurred. The earliest singing in the church was conducted by a leader to whom the people gave response and song, antiphonal singing, in which two choirs sing alternately, developed in the East, first, as far as we know, at Antioch. Ambrose introduced the practice of antiphonal singing in the West and in Milan, from which it spread throughout the Western Church. The veneration of Mary was also pretty well in place by the close of the 6th century, though the Roman Church didn't officially adopt the doctrine of her Immaculate Conception and Miraculous Assumption until 1854 and 1950, respectively. A misinterpretation of Scripture, coupled to the many miracles attributed to Mary by apocryphal works, led to a growing respect for her as unique in redemptive history. Several of the Church Fathers, influenced by the preference for virginity among the monastics, assumed the perpetual virginity of Mary. That heavyweight of theology, Augustine, claimed that Mary never sinned, and since it was assumed that a son held a special affection for his mother, Mary was appealed to to intercede with Jesus. After all, what son can refuse his mama? We're going to end this episode there with the mention of Augustine because he's a towering figure in church history that we'll need to look at soon. Just before Augustine, we need to look at another person that I'll mention, Ambrose. We'll do that next time as we move the story along and prepare to sit down with Augustine of Hippo. Again, as we close this episode, please like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so that you'll get a notification when new videos drop here at Into His Image. And if you would be so kind, please spread the word. Thanks.